Hey historians, welcome back to our history field, where we're using the game of soccer to understand World War I. As we last saw, some players on the red team are starting to lose steam. Looks like the green team is gaining the upper hand in this intense match. But wait, who's jogging onto the field? It's a referee. This match sure could have used a good referee earlier, considering how rough things got, right? Now that the final whistle is about to blow, a referee is crucial to ensure the teams shake hands and leave the field without starting another aggressive match. As we look at the hopeful referees of World War I, we'll look at how the great game of World War I ended, examine Woodrow Wilson's ideas to prevent another war from starting, and discuss how the Allied powers stepped onto the global field as referees to create peace with a significant agreement called the Treaty of Versailles. Do you think their efforts to referee the post-war world will keep the teams in line and prevent another rough game? Let's kick off our exploration and find out. Before we delve into the plans to create peace after World War I, let's talk about how the war came to an end. Imagine you're playing on the red team in our soccer game, and the clock is running down. The other team brings in a new player who's incredibly skilled and starts scoring more goals. You're exhausted. Your teammates are giving up. Your fans are angry. As the clock ticks, your fans decide to run your coach off the field because he's failing to support the team. How would all of this affect your motivation to keep playing the game? Well, that final play on our soccer field is kind of like what happened to Germany at the end of World War I. When the U.S. entered the war, they were like a significant new player joining the opposing team. The Allied powers were more motivated than ever, but the Central powers started to lose morale. One by one, similar to players losing their motivation in a long soccer match, the Central Powers began to give up, and soon enough, Germany was the last player standing. Meanwhile, the German people were getting really tired of the war. Having to divert so many resources to the war effort caused a severe food shortage within Germany. Also, many Germans didn't think their soldiers would be able to win the war. Also, remember how Germany had an authoritarian government? Well, the German people thought it was about time for some democracy, so they started a revolution. The leader of Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm II, had to give up his power, just like the red team coach who was forced off the field in our soccer game. Germany ushered in a new era with the formation of the Weimar Republic, a shift towards democratic governance. The new leaders signed an armistice, an agreement to stop fighting, and World War I was finally brought to an end. Now that the fighting was over, all of the countries involved in the war had to sign a treaty, an official contract where they agreed to make peace. This treaty would be known as the Treaty of Versailles. The leaders of Britain, France, Italy, and the U.S met in Paris to discuss what should be included in the treaty, but they each had very different ideas. Woodrow Wilson tried to take on the role of referee and suggested some ideas about how he thought they could create peace and prevent future wars. His suggestions are known as the 14 points. In this plan, Wilson's main strategy was to avoid punishing anyone for World War I. He wanted to make sure the treaty didn't take one side or the other. Think about it like this. When you have an argument with someone, sometimes you want to blame them for everything. This can lead to even more arguments. But if you understand the root of the problem and talk it out peacefully, like Wilson suggested, you can sometimes develop a better, more understanding friendship. So instead of punishing the central powers, Wilson wanted to eliminate the root causes of war. He said that countries should no longer be allowed to form secret alliances and should reduce the size of their militaries. 
He also suggested redrawing some borders in Europe through something called self-determination. This is when people in a territory are allowed to choose their own government rather than having a foreign leader make those decisions for them. Think back to our previous lesson where we heard Wilson say he wanted to make the world safe for democracy. How do you think these points align with that goal? Wilson's first 13 points were all aimed at creating a more democratic and peaceful world where wars would rarely happen. But Wilson knew that even with these changes, conflicts might still occur. So in his final point, he suggested creating a League of Nations, an international organization, kind of like a big club, where countries could meet to talk about their problems rather than fight over them. So, what do you think about Wilson's points? If you were part of the team creating the Treaty of Versailles, would you agree with Wilson? When everyone got together to actually write the treaty, the end result might surprise you. Rather than creating a neutral treaty like Wilson suggested, the former Allied powers decided to punish the Central Powers, especially Germany, in the Treaty of Versailles. The British and French leaders thought that Germany's military actions, like unrestricted submarine warfare, had significantly escalated the war and pulled more nations into the conflict. So, while other Central Powers also faced consequences in the treaty, Germany was the main target. Let's go through four main consequences that Germany faced. First, Germany was blamed for the entire war and had to sign the War Guilt Clause, agreeing that they were guilty for starting the war. Think back to our previous lesson and how the war started. Do you think Germany should have been given all of the blame? Next, Germany had to pay reparations, which are payments a country has to make to repair the damages it caused in war. Germany had to pay immense amounts of money to repair entire cities and countries. This put a huge strain on Germany's post-war economy. Next, Germany was required to significantly limit the size of its military. This was because the former Allied powers were worried that if Germany kept a strong army and navy, they might start another big war. Lastly, Germany had to give up its overseas colonies and some territory in Europe it had taken. Let's check out this map that shows Germany's territorial losses, specifically this part. This is the Polish Corridor, land that was taken from Germany and given to Poland in the Treaty of Versailles. See how it kind of split Germany into two pieces? How do you think Germany will react to losing this territory? Now think about the actual terms of the Treaty of Versailles compared to what Wilson suggested. Which approach do you think would have been more successful at preventing another war? Wilson thought that punishing Germany would lead them to want revenge and could contribute to the start of another war. Unfortunately, he was exactly right, but we'll get into that in a later lesson. World War I was supposed to be the war to end all wars. People hoped that once the war ended, the world could live in peace. But that peace was short-lived. The failure of the Treaty of Versailles to create lasting peace serves as a reminder of the power of global compromise, understanding, and cooperation. When anger is used to make decisions, it can cause consequences for everyone. As we close out our unit on World War I, think back to Wilson's goal to make the world safe for democracy, and think about what you can do to promote democracy and peace in our world. Because remember, shaping the future begins with understanding the past. Hey.